This is the Adam Ragusea Pod, available free from any pod reproducing technology at your disposal. Time to Ask Adam. Uh, my name is Colleen and I live in Canada. Um, and my question is about cholesterol. So what is the deal with cholesterol? Do you really get high cholesterol from eating high cholesterol foods like eggs and also like high fat foods like high full fat dairy and and meat um i just a quick google gives really conflicting advice about it um and i feel like a lot of the recommendations maybe just come out of the war on fat from the 90s and uh, early 2000s so yeah what actually causes high cholesterol I feel you, Colleen. This is one of those things that should be easier to Google because there does seem to be a pretty clear scientific consensus now on the relationship between dietary cholesterol, the cholesterol you eat, and serum cholesterol, the cholesterol in your blood. There's pretty clear consensus on the relationship between those two things or the lack thereof. But the arteries of the internet just seem to be clogged with a whole lot of outdated information. High serum or blood cholesterol is definitely bad, or rather it can lead to bad things like heart attacks and strokes. Doctors and scientists used to figure, they used to figure, hey, there's this stuff we call cholesterol and it's in people's blood. And if they have too much of it in their blood, they tend to have heart attacks and strokes. This bad stuff is also in food, and you are what you eat. So obviously, if people eat less cholesterol, then less cholesterol will end up in their blood, and they'll be less likely to have heart attacks and strokes. Easy logic to reconstruct, because it does indeed make intuitive sense. But as is often the case with the intricacies of biology and chemistry, that which common sense would predict is often wrong because reality is weird. When we talk about cholesterol in your blood, we're generally talking about low-density lipoproteins, the bad cholesterol. As I understand it, Technically, LDLs are not cholesterol. LDLs are the things that carry cholesterol. LDLs are little packages of cholesterol bound inside other things, other packaging. Cholesterol is a specific class of lipids, fats. Cholesterol is a class of lipids used by your body for all kinds of essential life functions like making your cell membranes and for making your hormones and vitamin D and the bile acids you use to digest fat in the first place. All kinds of stuff requires cholesterol as a building block. We need all kinds of lipids to survive, including cholesterol. Problem is lipids cannot travel around in our bloodstream. I think basically for the same reason that your oil and vinegar dressing won't stay together without an emulsifier. Fat and water don't mix. The fat is less dense. It rises to the top and pools together. Blood is a water-based thing, so a bunch of fat separating out of your blood and settling up on top in the top of your head or something, that'd be really bad, one would imagine. That's just my guess as to why free lipids cannot travel in the bloodstream. I'm making that part up. (laughs) Though it seems like it could be true. Let me know if I have that right. Somebody who knows what they're talking about. But it's definitely the case that free lipids cannot travel in the bloodstream. I'm not making that part up. Google it. So to transport lipids around the body, you need an emulsifier. Just like you need an emulsifier for your salad dressing. And that emulsifier is the protein in the lipoprotein. It's like a protein chaperone for the lipids. It delivers lipids to all of your cells that need lipids to keep you alive. So cholesterol travels around in your blood in these lipoprotein clumps, as do triglycerides, by the way. It's all fat wrapped up in a protein package. 
It's basically chicken Kiev. Or chicken Kiev, I believe we're trying to say now, to favor the native Ukrainian pronunciation. Anyway, low-density lipoproteins deliver cholesterol to your cells via your bloodstream. And you need them. But when you have too many low-density lipoproteins, they can oxidize and collect in deposits in the walls of your arteries. These deposits are called plaque, and when they build up really thick, they restrict blood flow, which is bad. And they can suddenly break off in huge chunks and get clogged somewhere downstream, which is acutely bad. Talking heart attack, stroke, the things most likely to eventually kill you, other than cancer, and at the moment, COVID. High LDL in your blood is definitely bad because it can lead to plaque buildup, atherosclerosis. That doesn't necessarily mean that eating cholesterol is bad. Or rather, it doesn't mean that dietary cholesterol is your main problem. Why? Because your body makes cholesterol, whether you eat it or not. I'll say that again. Your body makes cholesterol whether you eat it or not. You biosynthesize cholesterol in your liver and in your intestines. Most of the cholesterol you have is homemade, not store-bought. Your body makes cholesterol out of the calories you pound. I believe chiefly from your dietary fat, uh, but also from ethanol, booze. Too many carbs is also bad for your cholesterol, but the reasons are more complicated. Uh, Simple carbs spike your blood sugar, which spikes your insulin, and that signals your liver to make more cholesterol, or so I have read. So basically, high blood cholesterol is more about how many calories in general you're eating, especially junk calories, rather than how much cholesterol you're eating. I quote now from an internet source that I turn to often, which is the Harvard School of Public Health. Quote, the biggest influence on blood cholesterol level is the mix of fats and carbohydrates in your diet, not the amount of cholesterol you eat from food. The last part of that quote is not controversial in the scientific community, as far as I can see. Dietary cholesterol has little causal relationship with blood cholesterol. That is the current consensus view. But the first part of that Harvard quote actually is kind of controversial. Harvard says the biggest influence on blood cholesterol is the level of dietary fats and carbs. That actually is kind of controversial because there are other scientists who say the biggest influence on blood cholesterol is genetics. The genetics that determine how much cholesterol your body actually makes out of the raw materials you provide it. The the genetics that determine how harmful that cholesterol will actually be to you inside your arteries. And also the genetics that determine your diet, how hungry you are for certain things. Also, certain people do seem to respond especially badly to dietary cholesterol, such as people with diabetes. Dietary cholesterol equals bad for diabetics, probably. Like If your doctor tells you to lower your dietary cholesterol, listen to your doctor. Don't listen to the internet cook who has a podcast. I'm not telling you that dietary cholesterol is fine. I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just telling you that the overwhelming expert view now is that dietary cholesterol is nowhere even close to being the main problem in most people who have high cholesterol. Most of the cholesterol you have, you make out of other stuff that's already in your body and out of other food that you eat. Saturated fat in your diet is associated with high blood cholesterol, probably. Trans fat, definitely associated with high blood cholesterol. Too much booze, too much sugar, too much fat of any kind, too much damn food, and not enough fiber. 
soluble fiber forms a gel and traps cholesterol. It blocks the absorption of cholesterol into your bloodstream, and you end up just passing it. Plus, fiber fills you up, and it slows the release of sugar into your bloodstream, which makes you less likely to spike your insulin and make yourself super hungry, even though you just ate like two seconds ago. Fiber is good. That is not controversial. Whether dietary cholesterol should be actively avoided is still a little controversial. For example, the U.S. federal government, in the dietary recommendations issued collaboratively by USDA and HHS, the feds still recommend minimizing your dietary cholesterol. Why do they recommend that? Well, because foods high in cholesterol also tend to be high in saturated fat. That is literally their reasoning. A healthy diet is usually, incidentally, a low cholesterol diet. Also, some minority of people do seem to have a particularly bad reaction to dietary cholesterol. So the feds figure, hey, let's play it safe and let's still tell everybody to minimize their dietary cholesterol, even though dietary cholesterol is probably not the direct cause of their problems. Judge for yourself the soundness of that reasoning on the part of the U.S. federal government. I question the reasoning because I fear that it could lead to the margarine problem. You tell everyone that dietary cholesterol is bad, butter has a lot of cholesterol, so people take your advice and they seek out replacement foods that have less cholesterol, like margarine. Problem is, Old school margarine was full of trans fat, which turned out to be way worse for blood cholesterol than basically anything. Trans fat is now almost entirely illegal, so that isn't so much of a problem anymore, but other problems like that could arise. Seems to me it's better to tell people what's actually bad for them. But anyway, I want to put a few giant caveats on everything that I just said. First and foremost, remember that I am not a doctor or a scientist. I am a guy who is perhaps particularly good at reading the internet. And I have more time to do it because it's part of my job. That is the service I provide you. Second, scientific opinion is constantly changing. And that's not because scientists are full of shit and making shit up as they go. It's because scientists are constantly learning more. The link between dietary saturated fat and high blood cholesterol and elevated risk of death and all of that. There is some controversy there. I've talked about that in previous videos. The overwhelming majority expert opinion remains that lots of saturated fat in your diet is bad. But I won't be surprised if we continue to see some nuance added to that over time as more research is done, in part because whenever you tell somebody to eat less of something, you also have to realistically consider what they're going to do instead. And that's where things get really complicated because too much sugar is also bad for you. Too much unsaturated fat is also bad for you. Too much food is bad for you, though not nearly as bad as too little food. Let us all be glad that most of us right now are more concerned with high cholesterol and type 2 diabetes and obesity than we are with starvation and malnutrition. The privilege to be more concerned with overeating than with undereating, that's a big W in my book. Thumbs up for having lots of food. Five-star review for abundant food so much better than the alternative. Hi, Adam. My name is Mason. I'm a listener from the Midwest here in the United States. And as a fellow sufferer of our ultra-modern processed food diet, I noticed that I'm lacking fiber as I count my macros. And you've discussed the same problem that you've had. And uh, most of us here in this uh, area at least don't get enough fiber in our diets. You've talked about it a couple of times recently how uh, plants obviously are a source of fiber and beans specifically are protein and fiber so that's something that's good for macros my question is what else is there 
uh, to get more fiber into our diets. Have you found anything that's uh, particularly good? I've tried some fiber supp supplements, the ones that you put in water, and those are, uh, well, the ones I've had are pretty nasty. So what do you think? Wow, what a, what a relevant and timely question, Mason. God, I wish I liked oatmeal. I have tried so very hard to like oatmeal. Oatmeal and sweet potatoes and beets. Three excellent things to eat that just turn my stomach. I do sure like beans, though. Beans and oats are great because they are rich in soluble fiber. So are fruits. So is barley. I should try more barley things. Because there's an important distinction to consider between soluble and insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber dissolves in water. Insoluble fiber does not. Both are good. Both are voluminous stuff we eat that our bodies cannot digest, so we just pass it. For example, cellulose. Cellulose, the polysaccharide that makes up the lion's share of the dry weight of most plants you've ever met. That's vegetable fiber, cellulose. We cannot digest it. So it's fiber. And it doesn't really dissolve in water, so it's insoluble fiber. Apparently, cellulose actually can <laughs> kind of dissolve a little bit in water in certain circumstances, but generally speaking, everybody considers cellulose to be an insoluble fiber. You get a lot of insoluble fiber from eating your vegetables and from bran coats, whole grains. And insoluble fiber helps you poop. It's like swallowing a sponge. It grabs a hold of everything else that you need to eliminate, and then, well, you know how the rest goes. Insoluble fiber helps you to avoid the discomforts of constipation, but it also uh, it helps you avoid all kinds of colorectal conditions. So it is an important thing to do. Plus, insoluble fiber is just a, a non-caloric bulk that takes up space in your stomach. Soluble fiber is different. Soluble fiber is stuff like resistant starch, pectins, mucilage, you know, the stuff that makes plant foods sticky and slimy and gooey. Oatmeal is gooey, chiefly because it has lots of mucilage, which your body cannot break down and digest. But it does dissolve in water, so soluble fiber forms a goo inside your guts. This goo feeds your microbiome, which is good. All the beneficial bacteria and other buggies in your intestines. This goo also slows the absorption of sugar into your bloodstream, which is good. We've discussed. This goo traps cholesterol, which we've discussed, plus other lipids. That's particularly good for this new world we live in where most of us eat too many lipids and we could stand to eliminate a few of them. Eliminate has a deliberate double meaning there. Another type of uh, soluble fiber is beta-glucans, which you can get from the cell walls of fungus, like mushrooms, yeast, and from some plants such as beans, dry peas, lentils, the legumes, also broccoli, which I love, and sweet potato, which I wish I loved. A guy named David uh, sent me an email to tell me that he, he blends a little mashed sweet potato into curries and sauces and of all kinds because he said it, it adds sweetness, but also seems to be a really nice thickener. He was wondering why it seems to thicken stuff so smoothly and nicely. And my best guess is soluble fiber, chiefly pectin, lots of pectin in sweet potatoes and lots of insoluble fiber as well from you know cellulose and lignin and such. In terms of health, the trusted dietary information sources usually say the same thing, which is don't worry about soluble versus insoluble fiber. Don't worry about it. Most sources of dietary fiber tend to have both. Just get more fiber, period. And the rest will probably take care of itself. And here are the two best ways to get more fiber. One, eat more things that aren't animal products. Meat and eggs and dairy have essentially no fiber, right? So actually, rather than saying eat more things that aren't animals, 
eat fewer animal things and in their place, eat more things that aren't animals. And then number two, eat more non-animal things that are whole foods. Whole foods was a great term until it became the name of a polarizing grocery chain. Whole foods just means eat the whole thing. Don't drink orange juice, eat the whole orange because fiber. Orange juice is orange minus fiber. Fruits are a great source of soluble fiber. Don't just eat the inside of the potato, eat the whole potato, including the skin. I'm a big advocate of not peeling potatoes for a number of reasons. Don't just eat the sugar. Eat the sugar cane. <laughs> the interior part of the sugar cane is actually edible. It's, it's basically sugar, water, and fiber. I suppose that one's not super realistic. So here's a better one. Here's a better one. Don't just eat the endosperm of the wheat, a.k.a. white flour. Eat the whole kernel of wheat, a.k.a. whole wheat flour. And as much as I love olive oil, don't just eat the oil eat the olive sometimes. We are biologically conditioned to seek out the digestible part of the plant because the digestible part of plants was more scarce in the environment for which we are evolved. But now we get too much of the digestible part and not enough of the indigestible part. I know they tell me not to worry about insoluble versus soluble fiber, but my own back of the envelope math tells me I'm particularly deficient in soluble fiber, which again is why I wish I liked oatmeal. But I do like beans. I like carrots. I like cabbage, onions, all good sources of soluble fiber. I even kind of like okra, which is virtually exploding with soluble fiber. That's why it's so slimy. All that indigestible but soluble mucilage. Brussels sprouts, broccoli, turnips, tons of soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. Basically eat vegetable soup. Just eat more relatively unprocessed plants in place of other things. Eat an apple for dessert instead of a cookie. Both are plants, but the apple includes the indigestible part of the plant, a.k.a. the fiber. The cookie is basically just the digestible part of several plants extracted and mixed and baked. The apple is less fun than the cookie, but life is about balancing competing interests. And a good apple is real, real good. I just wish they were really good more often. And one time we lived in Boston and uh, Lauren and I did that thing that all the Boston yuppies do where you drive up to New Hampshire in the fall and you go apple picking. And we brought back this big sack of apples and I figured that I would throw them away after a few weeks, but I ate every single one of them. Those apples were so period good, period. Every other time in my life when I've gone to eat an apple, I've been like, well, I guess I'd better eat an apple. But those New Hampshire apples, I was like, I want to eat an apple every bit as much as I want to eat a chocolate chip cookie. Those apples ruined me for life. Nothing since has ever compared. So I had a chocolate chip cookie tonight instead of an apple. But that's okay, because I work out with Future, the sponsor of this episode. Have you noticed I'm looking a little stronger lately? It's because Future is working. If you're anything like me, you maybe enjoy working out and you, you maybe know basically how to work out, but you need to be pushed. You need a trainer to show you some new stuff to do, some stuff that, that'll push you out of your comfort zone and help you grow or shrink, depending on your particular goals. You need a trainer to push you harder, to you know, squeeze one more rep out of you, 10 more burpees out of you, whatever. You need a trainer to hold you accountable to make sure you're actually doing your workouts, even on the days when you'd really rather not. This is what I get from my future trainer, Jose. Future is a new fitness app on your phone that pairs you with a highly qualified personal trainer who will design workout plans for you based on a conversation you'll have about your goals. And this trainer will follow your progress, maybe nudge you if you need some nudging, and also be your cheerleader. 
doesn't matter what equipment you have access to, future trainers can totally break you <laughs> with just your body weight. Trust me, I, I know. I've been doing future workouts for about three months. I've not missed a single one because I don't want Jose to be mad at me. And I follow them right off my phone in the privacy of my garage so that I can look like a fool as I try new movements that push me out of my comfort zone and help me grow in the places I want to grow and shrink in the places I want to shrink. And it is working, my friends. I'm 40 years old, and I don't think my lower body has ever been stronger. I send Jose videos of my lifts. He critiques them. I improve. And it is far less expensive than traditional in-person training. You can try your first month of Future for just $19 if you go to tryfuture.co slash Adam Ragusea. That link is in the show notes slash description. Tryfuture.co slash Adam Ragusea. My full name, all one word. Tryfuture.co slash Adam Ragusea to get your first month of workouts for just $19. Thank you, Future. Hello, Adam. Uh, My name is Damon. You know, like Matt Damon, but much more handsome, as you can see. My question is about French fries, or chips, as some people call them in different parts of the world. We've probably all had the experience of attempting to eat leftover fries an hour or so after they were cooked, only to find that they are, to put it mildly, disgusting. Not only is the texture mealy, even the salt is has lost its flavor somehow, although maybe I imagined that a bit. Furthermore, nothing seems to be able to rescue them back to anything even resembling their former glory. Microwaving this makes them hot and mealy. Uh, Baking them just dries them out. Um, Refrying them in a pan just makes them overly greasy, and the ones that aren't still mealy are just burnt. So my question is twofold. What exactly is happening to french fries from a scientific biochemical perspective as they sit on the counter and cool off and whatever else is going on. Uh, And secondly, are there any techniques that you can point to, either something to help prevent this breakdown from occurring before you cook or something that uh, halts the process after you cook? Uh, Damon, for those not watching this on YouTube, uh, Damon, I will point out, uh, is a a gentleman of a certain age, such as myself. Uh, Damon, you are a, a fellow member of the Salt and Pepper Beard Club. I am so jazzed that I finally got gray in my beard. I don't know about you. I've been waiting for this my whole life. Anyway, Damon, uh, basically, everybody younger than you and me is screaming inside their brains right now. They're screaming, oh, you absolutely can reheat French fries with, well, I, I refuse to say the name, but it's the newfangled tabletop convection oven that the kids today call something that rhymes with spare tire. Tabletop convection oven might as well be called the French fry fountain of youth because this is probably the thing that tabletop convection ovens do very best. The fries come out arguably better than they were when they first exited the deep fryer. Why does the tabletop convection oven succeed where others have failed? Well, first let's go over why old fries are terrible. Old French fries are terrible because water from inside the fry and also water outside in the atmosphere, all that water collects in the crunchy crust of the fry, thus rendering the crust wet and soft and not crispy or crunchy anymore. Nature abhors a vacuum all systems tend toward equilibrium, and the moisture inside the fry equilibrates as the fry ages. The outside becomes just as wet as the inside. Plus, there's the moisture in the air. The result is limp fries, limp because their outsides have gotten wet. At the same time, the water that is immigrating into the crust is emigrating from the soft, fluffy center. It's leaving the center, and that makes the center tough. When you fry fries, the native starch granules in the potato heat up in the presence of the potato's natural water, and this causes the granules to burst open, 
that is starch gelatinization. And the steam pressure inside the fry structurally supports the formation of an open texture that's a fluffy interior. As the fries sit around and cool, first that open interior structure collapses due, I think, to the subsidence of steam pressure and the out-migration of water. When that happens, the fry feels denser as you bite through it because it is denser. And then, over several hours, you start to get starch retrogradation. The gelatinized starches that burst apart in the fryer, those start to reconnect and form starch crystals again. And starch crystals are tough. I believe the mealy texture you describe is retrogradated starch crystals. It is apparently possible to re-crisp fries in the microwave. There are people on the internet who have procedures for that. But because the temperatures you're able to create in the microwave are usually pretty low, it would take a lot of time to get the water out of the crust. And by that time, the interior will probably be far too dry. A conventional oven does a little better simply because you can get it a lot hotter. But again, it doesn't work fast enough. The interior ends up hard and dry by the time the exterior is crispy again. But then there's the new appliance that rhymes with spare tire, the tabletop convection oven. These not only get very hot, but they also move a ton of hot air around the food, even from the bottom, because these things have porous grates on the bottom. Hot air can rise up through the holes in the bottom and reach the food. Lots of convection means rapid transfer of heat to the fries, which means you can totally dehydrate the outsides again quickly before the insides dry out much more than they already have. Furthermore, the confined space of a small tabletop convection oven traps oil droplets that get blown loose from the surface of the fries, and those droplets get super hot in the air and they bash into the food again elsewhere and essentially refry it. I don't know how big of a factor that really is in practice, but there is some research looking into frying stuff with hot oil droplets suspended in a convection current. That's a thing. In my experience, fresh made fries from a restaurant where they start with like real potatoes in the back, those tend to revive best in the tabletop convection oven, especially if they are thick cut and especially if when they cooled, they cooled in a covered environment that retained steam, such as a restaurant to go box. All that means that the fry is likely to have enough water left in its center to refluff the center upon rapid reheating. Like McDonald's fries, in contrast, are so thin and they're so dry on the inside, even if you re-crisp the exterior, the interior is likely to still be hard. However, one thing you can do is wrap the fries in a damp towel, microwave them in that damp towel to drive steam inside the fry, and then unwrap them, put them into the tabletop convection oven to rapidly dehydrate the exterior and make it crispy again. And that apparently works great. By the way, uh, as unappetizing as that starch retrogradation process may be, there is reason to think that it may be healthful. Gelatinizing starch, cooling it for several hours, allowing retrogradation to happen, and then reheating it, all of that may result in an increase of resistant starch, which is a kind of dietary fiber. And fiber is great for all the reasons we were just discussing. Resistant as in resistant to digestion. I do not know if the reheating techniques that I just described would actually increase resistant starch, but I do know there is a ton of ongoing research into similar procedures for the express purpose of replacing some digestible starch in fries with resistant starch. More resistant starch means fewer calories for us people who get too many calories, and it means more food for the microbiome, which is good. 
powerful convection ovens of all kinds are so good at reheating pre-cooked fries that I think they are changing the restaurant industry. It is messy and expensive and dangerous for a restaurant to have a big, deep fryer. You have to worry about changing your oil and hiring a company to come dispose of the old oil. Uh, Local laws may require you to have an expensive hood over the fryer with an overhead fire suppression system. It's a whole, whole shebang. Convection ovens are much less hassle. And now restaurants can buy frozen, pre-fried French fries that were expressly formulated to be reheated in a modern high-powered convection oven. I have recently had the experience of going to a restaurant where they served what I'm pretty sure were frozen fries that they revived with convection in the back. And at first I was like, dude, that's cheating. You can't do that. But then I thought about it for a sec and I was like, wait a minute, these fries are great. These fries are great. What more do I want? I get great fries. The people in the kitchen don't have to work around a giant, greasy, boiling death trap. Seems like a win-win to me. Hi, my name's Elizabeth from Washington, D.C., and I have a really random question. I used to see on your cooking videos, you would use using these orange measuring cups, and they made me think of ones that my mother had since the 60s or 70s. Um, I really like the set because it included measuring cups for things like two-thirds and three-quarters of a cup. And I was just wondering if there is any history behind your use of those or those are some random measuring cups you picked up somewhere. Thanks. I chose to include your question, Elizabeth, not because I think my answer is terribly interesting, but rather I just wanted to give you props for being so observant. Like, it takes a special level of observational skill to notice that an internet cook is using orange plastic measuring cups and to think to yourself accurately, well, I bet there's a story there because there's a story there. So good on you, Elizabeth. Uh, So when my wife, Lauren, and I uh, first moved from Boston to Macon, Georgia, a long time ago, we were young and we were strapped for cash. Uh, We both had good jobs in Boston, and we'd saved up enough money to put down 20% on a house. Not a house in Boston, (laughs) Uh, but enough for a house in Macon, Georgia, which is why we left Boston. But anyway, uh, we were young, we were short on cash, and the purchase of our new Georgia house had not quite gone through yet. But I needed to be in Macon to start the new job that I had taken there. So there was a period of a few weeks where I lived in my new boss's basement in Macon, and Lauren stayed with her mom in Tennessee with our dog, Lucy, who was still alive back then. And uh, Lauren and Lucy did not want to stay in the basement. So my mother-in-law's house was a place of free temporary lodging. That's where they were staying. Anyway, uh, we finally got the purchase of our Georgia house finalized, despite some last minute uh, drama where our title attorney screwed something up. And for some reason, we suddenly owed thousands of dollars that we literally did not have. But uh, anyway, it all got straightened out. Anyway, Uh, We moved into our our beautiful little house in Macon that I miss very much sometimes. And uh, as we unpacked and we started to live our lives in the new house, I found an orange measuring cup inside Lucy's bag of dog food. The orange measuring cup belonged to my mother-in-law. Lauren grew up using these orange measuring cups as a kid And when she needed to scoop Lucy's dog food back at my mother-in-law's place, she naturally reached for the orange measuring cup because that's what was there. And then we accidentally stole the orange measuring cup during the move. My mother-in-law absolutely noticed, but we never got around to returning it to her. And then some years later, I randomly blew up on YouTube and I started making videos where I used the the accidentally stolen orange measuring cup. And my mother-in-law absolutely noticed that too. I love her. I love her to pieces. She's my most loyal viewer. Like 10 minutes after the videos go live, I'll get a text that says, uh, that is my measuring cup. (laughs) So anyway, uh, she ended up finding an identical orange measuring cup set online and she bought it and sent it to me. And I appreciated that. 
and I still never gave back the old stolen cup. She can come get it, get it anytime. I mean, she, she knows where I live. But I like to keep the original stolen one because it reminds me of that very exciting and momentous period of life and reminds me of our old dog and, and all of that. So Elizabeth, if you have similar nostalgia that you would like to indulge, uh, just Google orange Tupperware measuring cups. There are vintage sets out there to be had. Hey, Adam, my name is Andrea. For some context to my questions, apologies if it's a bit of a ramble. I'm a first generation Eurasian, so my father is Italian and my mother is Asian. I identify as being mixed race, i.e. I don't associate with one culture more than the other, though I do hold an Italian passport. But one thing that's always on my mind is what sort of nationality or identity will my children have, especially if their mother is of two different nationalities. Similarly, in a lot of your videos, you associate with your Italian heritage a lot, as is reflected in the recipes you cook. But what sort of cultural identity do your children identify with? Do you still feel connected with your Italian roots? Furthermore, how do you think the whole concept of a nationality or cultural identity will evolve as the world becomes more and more diverse and people start having more mixed children? Thanks as always for making the pods, and I hope to hear your answer. Yeah, so I think that this is the cross-generation journey that basically all immigrant families go on. Um, my great-grandparents, on my father's side, they were all Italian. They all came on the boat and they settled in New York City with the broader wave of Southern Italian immigrants in the early 20th century. They settled in an Italian ghetto in the Bronx and they barely learned a word of English, did not assimilate at all. They had kids. Those kids were born and raised in New York, so they learned English, and they assimilated somewhat, but they still spoke Italian at home with their parents, and they lived in an Italian-American ghetto in the Bronx, and so they mostly socialized with other Italian-Americans, and they married other Italian-Americans. Then they had a kid, my dad. Then they moved from the Bronx out to the new suburbs on Long Island. My dad picked up some Italian curse words and he learned how to act like a grease ball. But other than that, he was a pretty standard issue Euro-American kid. And he left New York for school and for work, which eventually led him to meeting and marrying my very not Italian Midwestern mother. But dad's Italian heritage was still really important to him. And so he really inculcated my brother and me. He showed me the Godfather when I was way too young for it. The Mo Green special really haunted my dreams for a while. And we visited my grandma a lot, who was born in New York, but she was still super Italian. Um, when I was a kid in school, white people in the little central Pennsylvania school where I was, they were still connected enough with their immigrant roots that ethnocentric jokes made sense to us. So like kids on the bus would make fun of each other for being Polish or for being Irish because everybody knows the Poles are dumb and Irishmen are drunks or whatever. Um, those kinds of ethnic stereotype jokes still happened on the elementary school playground between kids like me who were two or three generations removed from Europe, from Poland, from Ireland, from Italy, right? But then I married someone with no Italian heritage at all. So my kids are a quarter Italian. And I suspect that ethnic identity dies with me. I think the American Ragusia family line will be fully assimilated into mainstream United States culture as of its fifth generation, my kids. And that same process has already happened for earlier waves of immigrants, and it is still happening for later waves of immigrants. 
xenophobes and racists in the U.S. love to say, oh, the, the problem with these Hispanics is they don't want to assimilate. They're not, they're not even learning English. Well, you know, the first generation almost never assimilates. Just wait and see what their kids and their grandkids do. You can see it right now. It makes me sad that the Italian-American identity in our family probably dies with me and with my brother. That identity has certainly been a great source of inspiration and joy for me in the kitchen. And I have made a lot of money making Italian-American foods on the internet and triggering Italians in the old country who are absurdly tradition-bound. And I think that's one reason why Italian society is relatively less dynamic now compared to other European societies with equally long histories. I do not mind pissing those Italians off because they are gatekeepers, and I am here to defeat the gatekeepers. Not all Italians, obviously. Hashtag not all Italians. But this is why I have to remind myself, yes, yes, my family has lost something by diluting its Italian blood, but it has also gained so much. I think it's pretty clear that diversification is a net good in nearly every case and nearly every aspect of life. And it's not like the Ragusias and their ancestors were always one thing. They were not always from Bari. They all came from somewhere else at some point. Like most Southern Italians, we have big noses and dark complexions. So some of our ancestors probably came from North Africa or the Levant. You think my great-grandparents lamented the cross-generational dilution of their Moorish heritage? Maybe some of my ancestors came down from Northern Italy, right? I don't know. Maybe they did. Do you think that my great-grandparents lamented the cross-generational dilution of their Lombard heritage? Of course, the Lombards all came from somewhere else too, namely Northern Germany, right? Do you think the first Lombard kings lamented the loss of their Germanic heritage as their children grew up in Latin culture? Well, of course they did. They definitely lamented that. And it didn't matter. Because that heritage got replaced with a new heritage over time. And that new heritage was also good. It was so good that several generations later, people lamented the loss of that heritage to an even newer one. What always seems to be lost on the traditionalists and the cultural revanchists is that change is the tradition. The only constant is change. You cannot step twice into the same stream, said Heraclitus 25 centuries ago. It's maybe a little more unnerving to some people right now because, you know, rapid advances in transportation and communication technology, that all means that every culture on earth is changing really fast all at once in a way that is totally unprecedented. I understand why that freaks people out, but they should take solace in the fact that everyone is going through it together, including you, Andrea. Andrea, I'll be curious to, to see how your own cultural identity evolves through your children. I think one reason my Italian identity grew so strong is that my non-Italian mother is standard-issue white American Euromutt without a particularly strong or focused identity, ethnic identity, beyond that. So nothing competed for the Italian in me. <laughs> You, Andrea, it sounds like you, you might be in a different situation. It sounds like you have one parent with a strong Italian identity and another with a strong Asian identity. Or maybe it's not so strong, because I feel like if it was strong, maybe you would have specified what country in Asia, but uh, I don't know. I, I wonder if kids who have two super strong ethnic identities on either side, I wonder if they end up like gravitating to one at the expense of the other or if they are motivated to find new third identity because they got the, the two ones warring above their shoulders. I don't know. I just know that change is not to be feared. 
all beloved cultures were created by people changing and abandoning earlier cultures that were also beloved. We must all live in the time that is given to us instead of trying to bring back the old days because that is impossible and because there's really no reason to think that the old days were better than what is to come. Certainly people such as white racists in the United States, they will tend to make the argument that diversification and global assimilation will result in the erasure of any distinct cultural identity. It's going to be like smushing up all the colors on the palette and all we'll have left is a sea of brown or gray or whatever. That's the the white genocide argument so often made by white racists these days. And I just want to ask these people, have you seen the world? Like, do you really think there's no difference anymore between you, dude in Ohio, and some guy in Borneo or Zimbabwe? Or even some guy in another highly developed Western nation, like Belgium. Like, you ever met a Belgian guy? He's nothing like you, dude in Ohio. It's still a really big world, and most people in it will never meet or interact with most of the other people in it. This is way too many. But most of us will gradually learn one international language, which looks like it's probably going to be English, unfortunately but whatever, English it is. And thanks to the internet and jet planes, we're certainly going to be able to learn a lot more about each other and mix up with each other to an extent never previously possible. And I think that's great. I think that's great for any number of reasons, not the least because the blending of cultures always yields tasty food. See the bibimbap recipe that I published on YouTube on Thursday. Josh and Vic, two kids of a Korean mom and a Tennessee dad that grew up here in East Tennessee with other kids in the neighborhood who made fried chicken at their homes. And Josh and Vic wanted to make fried chicken too, but they only had Korean ingredients at their house because their mom did the grocery shopping. So this naturally led them to invent some awesome Korean fried chicken recipe and all kinds of other delicious recipes that mashed up Korean and Southern U.S. food. And now they have a restaurant here in Knoxville called Soul Brothers. The name evokes soul food, which is the food of black Americans from the South. And it evokes Korea because it's spelled S-E-O-U-L, as in the capital of South Korea, Seoul. Everything at Soul Brothers is insanely delicious, worth a special trip to Knoxville, Tennessee. Lord knows who their kids are going to grow up to make babies with, but can't wait to find out what those babies grow up to cook. I hold in my hand now another delicious product of cultural cross-pollination. Lauren saw these in the store the other day, and she just had to have them. They are shortbread crumb dunkers, as baked by Bill Knapps. Naps with a K, knap, super German. I looked this up on the internet. Bill Naps is a defunct restaurant chain originating from Battle Creek, Michigan, home of the cereal. There's no restaurant chain anymore, but apparently they still make baked goods, such as the shortbread crumb dunkers. Shortbread being a Scottish pastry, at least the name is of a Scottish origin. The crumbs are just German streusel, straight up. And uh, these are coated with red, white, and blue sprinkles. Those colors combined with the United States flags and fireworks illustrations on the box would seem to suggest this product is intended to celebrate the upcoming 4th of July holiday, Independence Day here in the United States, when we celebrate our independence from Britain, which includes Scotland. Home of the shortbread. And they are called shortbread crumb dunkers because you are meant to dunk them in coffee. Coffee being a drink from East Africa slash Arabia, now primarily grown in Latin America. And let me tell you, the shortbread crumb dunkers are real good. Hashtag not an ad. I am grateful for the mashup of cultures that brought these into my house. 
The Lauren and I were talking about them, and I could not quite remember the name of them. The closest thing that I could summon in my addled, overworked, 40-year-old brain was crumb dumpsters. And Lauren laughed so hard and so uncontrollably at crumb dumpsters that I thought she was going to have to uh, literally pass out in order to return to normal breathing. But now, I kind of want to invent my own dessert called Crumb Dumpsters. I mean, that's a name that strongly suggests certain culinary ideas to me. So when I, fourth-generation Italian-American Euromutt Adam Ragusea, when I end up posting a recipe for Crumb Dumpsters, Think of all the different cultural exchanges that led to that innovation, and tell me you aren't grateful. But if you eat them, you'll definitely need to uh, go work them off with a subscription to Future, the sponsor of this episode. Tryfuture.co slash Adam Ragusea. Hashtag ad. Talk to you later, crumb dumpsters. Thanks for listening to this crummy pod. If you like this show and you want it to continue, well, consider uh, doing some things that would help me grow the audience. You could uh, subscribe to it on a podcast app if you've not already done so. You could leave a a rating and or a review. Um, If you're watching the pod on YouTube, give the vid a like, leave a nice comment. If you have a question or a comment for a future episode, send me a video file, ideally, or at least an audio file. Send it to askadamquestions at gmail.com, askadamquestions at gmail. Do me a favor and type up your question, too. That'll help me find you. And uh, good luck finding yourself. Good luck finding your unique cultural identity. The kitchen is a great place to look for that. Talk to you next time.